Welcome to Pigskins and Pageantry, a podcast dedicated to all things SEC football. My name is Wes, and I'd like to invite you to join me, Jesse, and Matt each week as we discuss last week's games, news from around the league, make predictions for the upcoming games, and much, much more. I, I'm a little bit terrified at the forced smiling going on right now, but uh, uh, anyway, what's up, everybody? It's Wes. Uh, it was quite the weekend of football with some very big games to talk about. Obviously, those games involved each of the teams that we cheer for. And so uh, on that note, uh, I would just like to commend the dedication to professionalism exhibited by both of our other hosts who are here to talk about football, regardless of the outcomes of last weekend. So let's start with Jesse. How are you feeling? Um, I am dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, all, that's all you got to say about that that's really all i have to say and that's all i'm gonna say about that um, <laughs> not really i'll say a lot about it when we get there uh yeah. hanging in there um you know matt's matt's cheeks have to be on fire right now over that um... i'm so happy <laughs> everything's great oh my god my face hurts um everything's fine everything's fine um listen We'll talk about it. It wasn't yeah. a great weekend. It is what it is. Well, we, yeah, we will talk about the last week's games, talk about our latest CFP rankings, which are hot off the press, mm-hmm. uh, discuss the elephant in the room regarding our comments from a few weeks ago about the state of LSU's program, uh, which uh, yeah. apparently enraged many of the Tiger faithful. And uh, we'll also make predictions for this upcoming weekend's slate of games. So uh, let's get right to it. Always remember... If you ain't first, you're last. All right. The uh, first game from last week that we'll talk about is uh, Kentucky at Mizzou. <clears throat> Kentucky winning this one 21 17. Jesse gets the point here. Um, not a ton of offense on this one, um, in terms of points, at least. Um, well, in terms of yards, either. Uh, Rodriguez uh, got over 100 yards on the ground and Levis passed for three touchdowns. So, even though there weren't a ton of yards, um, it appears that Rodriguez had most of them <laughs> and uh, Levis had the uh, had the touchdowns. So um, let's start with, well, you guys just jump in. What are your takeaways? What are your takeaways from Kentucky at Mizzou? What happened to Kentucky? Like, <laughs> Kentucky shouldn't be struggling with Missouri, surely. Not be on par with them, no. I mean, good Lord, guys. I don't understand what in the world's happened. I, Will, I think Tennessee broke Will Levis. Um, <laughs> granted, I mean, his numbers aren't awful, but is that first round NFL draft numbers? No. 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 <laughs> um, especially against, although in their, in his defense, Missouri's defense isn't completely awful. They did just re-sign their They're defense sneaky. coordinator to a contract. They're okay. Hey. They're okay. The defense is okay. Remember? <laughs> Sometimes. Hey, listen, it's better than Tennessee's defense, probably. <laughs> better than Bama's defense. Hey. Well, depending on the opponent, apparently. So, yeah. I don't know. Um, Jesse, you have any uh, takeaways? I mean, that's my thing. Is like Mizzou's defense is okay, <laughs> but their <laughs> offense is woof. I mean, they finished two for thirteen on third down. Uh, many of those were passes that were thrown far short of you know the sticks there and the tigers were called for seven penalties which added up to 77 yards and you know i i feel your pain there i get it um but you know cook fumbled the ball away on a play when he wasn't even touched the tigers turned over the ball on downs um on the kentucky side of the field when they ran that aforementioned quarterback sneak so the offense is woof and no matter how good or okay your defense is, you have to have the offense to back it up. Uh, and then on the opposite side, on Kentucky, Rodriguez is good, but I don't think the Kentucky O-line is. I think that's where the struggle is coming from. Offensive line issues continue to plague them, and it appears like Will Levis is doing as much as he can, but all you can do is you know, take the time that the O-line gives you Um, and I don't know how to help that right now. I don't know that this season they're going to be able to make that much improvement to get him the time that he needs, um, and to make the holes that the running backs need. So Mizzou defense. Okay. And, um, the O-line at UK me. Yeah. Well, my takeaway is these teams are, as Michael Scott would say, ununderstandable. 
um it's it's like like you like you've already said like what is going on here now i will say i will say obviously uh georgia struggled against mizzou at mizzou it's one of those weird weird places it kind of lulls you to sleep you walk in you're like oh what a nice little place this is and then you're like oh, i'm not gonna have to actually play this game this is gonna be nothing and then before you know it you have a fight on your hands and you're like oh crap i better kick it into high gear here and hope that it's not too late by the time you decide to do that. I don't know if that's what happened here, but I can I can guess. But uh, they had they almost had a literal fight on the sidelines during this game, yeah. if I remember correctly. So, I mean, it it does happen. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's move to Florida at Texas A and M. Florida winning this one, forty one to twenty four. Jesse getting the point in this one also. Um, so in a bizarre turn of events, most of AM starters, 19 total players, both starters and backups, were out with the flu in this one. So um still, I mean, they flung they they hung with Florida leading 24 to 20 at half. Mm -hmm. But as you might suspect, when you're missing that many people, depth is gonna become an issue, especially that many starters. Uh so it seems like that really that really was an issue for them uh, as it was all Florida in the second half um what are you guys takeaways from from this weird game <laughs> so we i mean the depleted roster right like everybody just if you're in the a&m locker room six feet apart all right just don't <laughs> everybody don't share drinks like ew uh bad tackling i don't think it was just having all those players out i mean i understand that literally like half the defense if not more was gone so were their backups and they I don't know if they did tryouts midweek or what happened but they found somebody to take the field on defense but there was bad tackling and then it seemed like when they came out in the second half it was just regression they couldn't keep their foot on the gas in the second half and that's bad you can't do that um and I was that's happy to coaching. find them. oh you mean that's coaching part of him <laughs> um and i was happy to see uh richardson for florida finally show that kind of dual threat aspect of his game he scored two rushing touchdowns for the gators in the first half um on the 11 yard td run and 60 yard td run that had you know the entire a m defense and their backups or their towel boys or whoever it was completely fooled <laughs> Um, he also made some crafty moves with, you know, a fourth and six play shovel pass to Johnson for an 18 yard gain. And uh, then he threw a pair of touchdown passes in the second half. He finally finished the game with 201 yards passing and 78 yards rushing. So we're starting to see, and I understand it's against a, I don't, under, maybe the band was playing defense. I'm not sure, but it is good to start to see that from him that he can do it. And again, I maintain that I think he needs another year till he's in prime form, but I thought it was encouraging to see. Yeah, Matt. Um, I, mm, listen, <laughs> there are about 88 million reasons why we should go ahead and pull the trigger on this Jimbo Fisher thing. Um, I don't know what in the world's happened to Texas A&M. Um, they're three and six right now. One and five in the conference is just what? Um, they're on their longest losing streak of five games since, and that's the longest one since 1980. Um, and I can't remember the stat I saw earlier, but I think it's like Jimbo's two and eight against the top 25 over the last two years or something like that. It's awful. And I'm not sure what in the world happened. I don't think I've ever seen an SEC team because weren't wasn't AM ranked like number three at the beginning of the six. season or something six. six. So they yeah. were top 10. I don't think I've ever seen a team take a nosedive like A and M has done this. With season. the number I, one recruiting class, yes. And, and and here's and and they lost some recruits this past week. I think I seem mm -hmm. to remember. I think the uh, what was it their top linebacker can't uh uh recruit bailed out or somebody he got I don't remember but um this is just not a good look for <laughs> Jimbo in any way they shape. They may or not form. make I, a bowl game. They very There's, well may yeah, not make it. Well, they got to go to Carolina this weekend, I think. And an Auburn? Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. They got to go to they got to go to Auburn. So that's automatically kind of eh, to begin mm. with. So mm. I um, it's not it's not good times in College Station. Um, Florida, on the other hand, 
on the verge of getting bowl eligible, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, considering the ups and downs that Florida's had this season, uh, I think this is a good rebound win for them after um, the uh, polite conversation that they had with Georgia last weekend. Um, so <laughs> I would imagine that this is a good bounce back for the Gators. It'll be interesting to see how they respond uh, going into play um, uh, South Carolina this next week, because that's hey. usually a little bit of a trap game for them, historically right. speaking. Yeah, it, uh, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to talk about both of those things, but it sounds weird. Um, so um, <clears throat> you're talking about regression. This is regression of literally historic proportions. <laughs> it, it feels like 1980 out in College Station, um, and it's uh, not in a good way. So um, it, it feels weird to kind of uh, continue to make excuses for Jimbo, but this is kind of a made-to-order one. Everybody had the flu. <laughs> what are you going to do? Huh? Um, so it's just, it's, it's weird. Like you said, they may not make a bowl game and considering where they started this year, uh, just crazy, just a crazy turn of events. I wonder how many you up texts that Kevin Sumlin's getting from the A&M boosters. <laughs> oh. Yeah. It's one of those. Uh, oh no, no, uh, they're probably, they're, they're probably talking to somebody in uh, lynchburg virginia right now but oh no Ooh. that's auburn sorry auburn's calling lynchburg what's oh. the what's what's the wolverine meme where he's uh laying on the bed wistfully looking at the at the picture <laughs> that's <laughs> kevin sumlin <clears throat> kevin. yeah um all right let's uh let's move on to tennessee at georgia uh georgia winning this one 27 to 13 uh, i was the only one to pick georgia uh, although i didn't pick them by the by the margin that they won so um so i got the point here um, so just summarize the game real quick. I mean, it was a big one and uh, game day was there and, and all that good stuff. Um, uh, on the first possession <laughs> and Dejan Edwards fumbled and uh, me just sitting there watching, I'm like, here we go. Uh, set up the Vols on Georgia's side of the field. Uh, the defense did hold them to a field goal though. And then on Georgia's, uh, uh, possession or second possession, Stetson avoided a sack and ran it in for a touchdown. It did have to be reviewed. And the touchdown was awarded, but no targeting. He did get hit in the helmet. I don't know. Let's. I, that, yeah, you know. I that whole play was really weird because I was waiting for them to say targeting, and then they never did. And I'm like, yeah, it looked a little bit like targeting. Like I could see where you'd throw the flag and at least review it, but right. Yeah, but Apparently, they they were more focused on the the, the touchdown they were, than they the targeting. Really, I don't know how they botched that call for the touchdown. It was clearly. Like I don't know touchdown. either. Because especially with the the judge right there, I mean he yeah, he didn't right even it wasn't even close to stepping out. I don't know. Anyway, um, in the next few possessions at the end of the first quarter and into the second quarter, Georgia was able to work the ball downfield with receivers who managed to get open. Stetson throwing accurate deep passes. Um, Georgia scored a couple more times thanks to plays like this, and then the defense uh, really seemed to do a good job of covering Tennessee's receivers, mostly man coverage. Um, and they were able to get pressure on Hooker. Uh, Keely Ringo uh, also intercepted him with about five minutes left in the second. Uh, by which half. was the most ridiculous looking interception I've ever seen. In my it looked like life. His, he had the he had the better position on the ball than the receiver did. The receiver yeah. should have turned into a defender was, at that point. It was, it was like awful. you said, it was weird looking. Uh, by half, it was twenty four six Georgia. In the second half, Georgia continued to get pressure on Hooker and contain that high power Tennessee offense, but Georgia seemed to shift to a more conservative approach on offense. Um, at least from my perspective, I don't know, ran the clock, but didn't score much more. Uh, in the end, uh, the defense was able to, to close out the game. The offense possessed the ball enough to drain the clock and dogs won uh, 27 to 13. Um, what, uh, what you guys got for takeaways? I'm going to just quickly say, because most of it, I'm just going to let y'all have this one. Um, I actually wanted Tennessee to win because it looks better for Alabama if they win. Um, but good gracious, finally someone got pressure on Hendon Hooker. Heavenly day. And that yeah. was literally my only takeaway that's worth <laughs> saying um, because I hate them both. Well, I'm going to leave it to you guys. I understand. Matt? Um, listen, uh, this was this – was this was a bad day from the get um, when that fumble went down in the very first quarter, I, the very first drive, I was like, this is different. This is a little bit of a different feel than Tennessee Georgia game usually goes. And I Chance think that to was, silence was the crowd too. from there. Right. And, and, and we couldn't capitalize on it. Um, Tennessee struggled to move the ball. Um, that Georgia defense, which I had said was overblown and, um, you know, had not been challenged. Apparently I was wrong because they, 
did a great job of shooting that uh, offense out of the air and just completely shutting them down. Um, Hooker looked really uncomfortable all day long. Um, a lot of pressure in his face. Uh, he missed a couple of key throws early too that we typically we had seen previously. He would hit those earlier in the year. Um, on Saturday, he couldn't hit those to save his life. I'm going to chalk that up to a bad day. Plus, um, Jalen Hyatt, I think, in the post game interview said that that was probably one of the loudest experiences he's ever had. And this is a guy that's played in Neyland. Um, Georgia came to the Georgia crowd came to play. And they came to influence that game. And they did influence that game. I think there was like four or five false start plays just in the first quarter or second quarter alone. Um, and, you know, Georgia did a great job keeping them off the field. Two for 14 on third downs, usually not an indication that your offense is having a good day. Um, and just just a rough day for the Vols offense all around. The defense tightened up in the second half. But again, that might be because Georgia decided to play a little bit more conservative, which I don't understand why in the world Kirby did that. Um, I'm not sure what the situation was with that particular thing. Um, maybe he was just trying to milk clock and get out of the game with a win uh, or something along those lines. But um, I, I'm here's my hope. This game does hurt uh, because I hate losing to Georgia more than anybody. Um, I did not have nice things to say about Georgia or anybody associated with that university on Saturday. Um and I still don't have a whole lot of nice things to say, except for Wes. Wes is the only decent one out there, from what I can tell. Um, the rest of them suck. Anyhow, um, <laughs> what an what an honor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and a, great, um, a nice person amongst horrible human beings. <laughs> yeah, you're you're the only tolerable one. The ball goose will back me up on this. Um, but with that being said, I would love to see this game again. Which you would think I wouldn't, but I would love to see this game again. But I would love to see this game after Tennessee's worked out some of the issues that they ran into in this one. Um, and have a chance to look at Georgia's tape and see what worked for them and also play this game on a neutral site. I think, I think if you take those factors into play, Tennessee has a better chance of winning this ballgame. I think the crowd took Hendon Hooker out of it. I think the crowd took the defense out of it. I think the crowd, the, the whole team was fired up all, as all get out during that game. You can tell just from the way that they were, and they dominated the line of scrimmage, absolutely dominated the line of scrimmage. Georgia's offensive and defensive lines did not give the Vols a chance at all due to how they were pushing everybody around. So I think the Vols finally I, got a taste of what everybody else got in Neyland this, this year. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it was a little bit of, I think, I think that played a, a lot larger part than people are making it out to be. Yeah. Um, from your perspective, Matt, I just want to, I just want to know, was that a safety in the end zone? Um. I know the play you're talking about to me. And th this is the problem with those safety. I think it was an incomplete pass. Cause it looked like his arm was moving forward. I would have been okay with lot. that call. It, it looked like it was moving forward a little bit. Now, whether the ball got advanced past outside of the end zone. No, I didn't think so. I thought yeah. that was a blown call, but in, and they reviewed it. I don't know how in the world they managed to get that ball squeaked out to the one inch line, but yeah, I, it, I would call that a safety or an incomplete pass before I call it whatever they call. It. I don't even remember what, advanced to the. They said it advanced out by to like the one yeah. foot line or whatever. I I, I could have stomached a um a incomplete pass. I could yeah. look at that and be like, okay, I get that. I did not understand the call. Yeah, I don't made. know either. But it, I mean, it, it worked out because um the 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 short field ended up being that that uh, touchdown pass right after it. So. I mean, who knows how it would have worked out, but still, it was it was kind of odd. Anyway, I mean, you guys already touched a little bit on it, and it's I, I was shocked how well Georgia's secondary was able to play the receivers. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to get pressure on on Hendon Hooker, but he had multiple plays where he had time and surveyed the field, and there was just nobody open. Covered sacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was I was watching this on TV, just like mouth wide open, like. <laughs> How is this possible? How are these guys, you know, covered like this? Because I've watched Tennessee all year and it hasn't been like this at all. Um, so kudos to the secondary on that. Um, they uh, they had so Georgia's defense came into this game with uh, 10 sacks on the year and they had six in this game. Ooh. So, um, I mean, that's another bizarre stat. I, I feel like uh, Stetson Bennett. Prove once again that he can handle the spotlight. I know a lot of people, even Georgia fans still, yes, still Georgia fans are still like, 
why is this guy in there with all our five stars on the bench? I, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I would argue that not only does he prove he can handle the spotlight, but I think some of his best games have come under the spotlight. So there's that. Um, I, I, I cannot stand the conservative play calling. Um, and when I'm watching, you know, run up the middle over and over again in like the third and fourth quarters, I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like I, it, when you play not to lose, that's exactly when you lose. Oh, we've watched Tennessee score quickly many times this year and i'm like before you know it if you screw around and you don't do what you've been doing tennessee's right back in this game um so i don't really understand that uh, todd munkin had a great game overall on offense and play calling um but then I, I just don't understand those those runs up the middle um I, i'm never i have never been a fan of taking your foot off the gas once you have a, a lead like that especially against a high-powered offense like tennessee so <clears throat> big win for Georgia, I, but can't get complacent uh, in these last few weeks. Um, not necessarily that I think they'll lose given the competition that they'll be playing, although who, who knows, uh, but also style points. And we're talking about the committee. Uh, Matt, to your point, you're talking about how this uh, loss will affect Tennessee. Well, spoiler alert, the committee apparently doesn't think it's that big it, of a deal. Not that big of a problem, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> So uh, anyway, um, yeah, so more more to follow on that. But uh, uh, yeah, that'll, that'll do it for that game. Let's let's go ahead and get to a, a shocker. And and this is this, remember last week when we were making our predictions, we we're like, we go from this big game, you know, Georgia, Tennessee to boo, Liberty at Arkansas. And um, boy, if that one wasn't uh, if you that wasn't wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Liberty won this one. Twenty one to 19. Nobody picked Liberty. Who would? Right, exactly. Who would pick Liberty? The exact point. Who in their right mind would look at, speaking of teams that have completely fallen off this season, Oh, what the hell, Arkansas? (laughs) (laughs) For real. I know this is a family-friendly show, but good (laughs) God, man. Yeah, it's unreal to to kind of see some of the losses that they've taken uh, this year. But they they were down 21-0, to and though they kind of started to climb back in this game, it was like too little, too late. It was no one. Of, it was one of those things where, again, we've kind of talked about a few of those games this year where you watch the game, you're like, surely this is going to change, you know, at some point. And it just uh, never really did. Uh, although they did almost have a chance. Uh, they did have a chance to tie it up, as a matter of fact, with a two-point conversion, uh, but came up uh, just short even after review at the end. And it, it was close, but I do think he was barely short this is liberty's first win against an sec school ever okay um (laughs) and to to kind of add insult to injury here liberty was playing their third string quarterback jonathan bennett who missed practice all week because he had the flu so you have your third string who didn't practice all week just came out and beat you like what um home at home and uh, lewis their tailback um also another story in this game his father passed away this week and he had a few big first downs for the flames so it's just uh, you know wild stories uh left and right in this game and uh you know big win for liberty um maybe a little bit of a, a resume booster for hugh freeze i don't know what do you what do you guys think a bit. <laughs> yeah i um this this game it was shocking. Um, in my formative years, I actually considered going to Liberty, and they had a football team. But then I was like, I don't want to go somewhere with a football team like Liberty. Like, no, thank you. Um, but then they turn around and they beat Arkansas, who was a top. Well, they were a top fifteen team at the beginning of the season. I think yeah. they got up to up to ten, uh, yeah. like around week three or four. Like this was a team that was supposed to be trending upward this season, and. I don't know what's happened. Now, as a Tennessee fan, I can't say a whole lot because, you know, we lost to Air Force and then we lost to uh, somebody else. We've lost those games too, but we also weren't a top, weren't ranked in the top 10 at one point that season when right. that happened. Georgia Expectations State, are a little bit different. Game. Yeah, it's just, that's rough, man. That's really rough. Um, and I hate this because it happens to the nicest coach in the SEC and Sam Pittman. Um, and so I'm, I'm, and maybe this was a look ahead game. That was kind of what I was thinking is this is a game where maybe they didn't prep as hard as they should have. And they fooled around a bit too much. Cause you know, they got LSU coming up next week. So maybe yeah. that was what happened. Yeah. Jesse. Yeah. I think this was a game too, where Arkansas secondary was supposed to be back in, in fighting shape. You know, they 
were close to whole again. They've had some some guys out. Um, defensive back Malik Chavez was back after missing time for a concussion, um, and he seemed to be that final piece for their banged up secondary to return and and get everybody firing on all cylinders. And I mean, he was the one that Liberty beat on its first passing touchdown of the game. Uh, he wasn't expected to necessarily be a savior for them um, in the backfield, but he, you know, he was supposed to be something and that didn't work, but you know, a third string quarterback who threw has thrown seven interceptions and completed less than 60% of his passes. It looked like maybe Arkansas would, would catch a break here. And they just didn't because that guy, instead of, you know, throwing more interceptions threw three touchdowns. Yeah. I, I, I truly don't know. I mean, it's not like their whole team had the flu. Right. What, what? I, I don't know. I don't know what the excuse might be um, other than maybe what you mentioned, Matt, maybe a little bit of a look ahead there. Uh, tough game for the hogs. Um, I've seen, I've seen Georgia do this time or two this year, but in Arkansas's case, they, they waited a little bit too late before they decided to actually show up. Um, <clears throat> so um, I can only assume that maybe they uh, underestimated Liberty. Uh, Cause I, I feel like, I mean, I feel like Arkansas is better than this, right? I mean, not to say, well, not to take anything. Against, was it? Oh my gosh, what it was this? It wasn't Southern Missouri, was it? Who was it? Southern it was, Mississippi, um, I think. Southern, yeah, whatever. Southern Southeastern directional oh. school. Directional school against um, what's his face? Yeah, uh, Petrino, Bobby, Bobby Petrino. Petrino. Yeah, Petrino. the were, almost yeah. revenge of the neck brace was the yeah. title of that episode. They <laughs> were doing horribly and almost lost that game they were able to come back finally but not this time yeah i um yeah i, I just i don't know what's going on there but um they gotta they gotta figure it out because uh, after a loss like that you gotta you gotta bounce back it's tough opponents left though um <clears throat> all right let's uh talk about alabama at lsu uh lsu winning this one by one 32 to 31 nobody picked lsu in this one um so there was no no why would you <laughs> again no uh, no scoring uh, in the first quarter in this one uh seven six lsu at halftime so kind of kind of boring in that respect but both teams uh seem to find more offense in the second half obviously looking at the score uh because uh the way the points worked out bama ended up going for two twice in this and failed both times uh, Jesse, I'm sure you have some thoughts on that, but, uh, LS, LSU got a clutch touchdown pass from Jaden Daniels to Mason Taylor to go up 24, 21 with one minute, 47 seconds left, which is a lot of time still. And, uh, Bama drove back down. Will Reichard tied it up 24, 24, uh, LSU knelt it and went to overtime. Okay. It's all right. So here we are in overtime, Bama scores on their first possession. And then LSU did the same on their possession. So I was just sitting there thinking, man, this is going to be a back and forth. We're going to have, you know, both teams score and it's just going to keep going and going. How many overtimes is this going to be? And then I see the offense still on the field after that LSU touchdown. Uh, Daniels rolled out right and found uh, Mason Taylor once again for the two point conversion and the win. So uh, just, you know, crazy game, crazy finish. Um, Jesse, what are your what are your thoughts? What are your takeaways? Which one? <laughs> um just would like to start off by saying um, it's not just us and it's not just me that didn't think LSU would win this. Turns out, I'm pretty sure every sports person ever didn't think they were going to win. And if you were an LSU fan and you watch game day, you can confirm that. Go back and watch it, buds. Um, I think the the first thing is we got outcoached, incredibly outcoached and outplayed in this game. Um, and I'll, I'll get to coaching in a minute, but we absolutely did. Uh, Bryce was not connecting with his receivers and he hasn't been connecting with them well all season, but it really seemed to show in this game. I don't know what was happening, but for the majority of it, it was almost like he was slanting his passes downward. I mean, they were just, just nose diving into the ground. Um, he was only able to complete 25 of his 51 attempts. Uh, for 328 passing yards. Again, I know that sounds insane. 328. Yes, I know. But um, still, he had one interception on the night, which was a costly one. And it happened quite quickly. Uh, our receivers continue to have a hard time getting separation for some reason. 
Uh, Ja'Cory Brooks led Bama, our, our receiving core, with 97 yards, but half of those yards came on a 41-yard touchdown catch because of broken coverage. Uh, I just, I don't know what's happening there. I don't know why we're not able to get this connection between receivers and Bryce, um, but I also don't understand why the hell Bill O'Brien thinks that when our quarterback isn't completing passes, that we shouldn't run the ball. We have <laughs> Jameer Gibbs. We have Roydell Williams. We were, our receivers were getting upstaged by running backs. Um, and it wasn't even just, you know, Jameer and Roydell. McClellan was also incredible. Um, 10 receptions for 134 yards. But I think the issue is our offensive line was struggling to make holes for these guys to run through. But at the same time, when our receivers aren't connecting with Bryce and he's not connecting with them, he's throwing things behind him. He's throwing things too far in front. What We've got to adjust and do something. And there were no adjustments made in this game, which was really, really frustrating. Um, we looked average at best. Uh, and then... Yeah, I mean, our defense was okay. We were able to get some pressure on Jaden Daniels, but again, it just was not, it's not the defense um, of, of the past and our secondary continues to get beat, which is a huge problem. And then for the past couple of days, the talk of the Bama town has been coaching changes. Everyone is, and it's not just me. If I'm the only Bama fan you've ever heard speak or talk to, you know I hate both of our coordinators with a fiery passion deep within my soul. Hate's not a strong enough word, Jesse. You need it's not. <laughs> I loathe them entirely. And what, what, hold on, hold on. The, which um, because you you've been doing a great job of comparing Bill O'Brien to an article of food. <laughs> so at what on the food scale, what is Bill O'Brien um this week after after last weekend? Bill O'Brien is essentially like a Taco Bell crunch wrap that is just sat on a frat counter for a week and a half. Oh, oh gosh. I did not need that. That makes table. the stale ham sandwich sound appealing. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's got sour cream on it. It's just oh, stop it. <laughs> just stop. That's where I'm at right now. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, uh, Pete Golding, honestly, to me, he's just like an overdone Thanksgiving turkey. He's just... Ugh, dry and bare it's, it's and, like the the christmas vacation turkey yeah <laughs> with the cat food yellow that's yeah. who he is to me but i'm not the only one that feels this way every single Bama fan feels this way especially those that are not just fans from you know this year or last year but we've seen incredible coordinators come and go because they become head coaches but um there's just a standard. And I know everyone's like, well, Nick Saban obviously doesn't see a big problem with it. I don't think that's true. I think Nick Saban understands there's a problem with it. However, Nick Saban doesn't have the same liberty that I do of getting on the internet and just saying whatever I want about the coordinators because that's his coworkers. They're mm -hmm. also people that report into him. And what kind of environment does that foster in a locker room and an office mid season? Like they can't, what are they going to do? you got to just like make stuff happen with what you have. But I think he's also seeing that there is a regression this season of a program, a program that went for a national title last year. And yes, we had people go into the draft, but there isn't a drop off of talent. It's not like all of a sudden, all of these people went to the draft and then we had a you know, 50th ranked recruiting class. That's not well, on paper. This was supposed to be Bama's year. I, I, I only say that because I heard multiple people say it last year where I, I feel like, it, yeah, yeah, this was supposed to be our year and it's just not happening. And I think once we start getting to the end of the season, we're going to start seeing that there's um, an overhaul of the Bama coaching department and not with Nick Saban, but with coordinators and the rest of them. Um, and one thing I would just like to point out Bama fans, if you're upset, this might help calm you. It helped calm me. LSU fans, if you're overhyped, this might help calm you. Um, the Tide's two losses so far this season came by a combined four points on the road against Tennessee and LSU, both top 10 ranked teams. Um, both night yes. games. 
Mm-hmm. Night games. Absolutely. We struggled against Texas and Texas A&M and some narrow victories, but I'm just saying combined four points with like, not, I mean, with less than a minute and then in overtime, um, it's going to be okay. I, I think we're okay, but this is rare. We typically in the past couple of years do not lose multiple games in a season, especially losing multiple games in a season going into iron bowl. So it will certainly be interesting. Just I say so that's the first time Losing. since 2012 that they lost uh, 11, two games I before. Believe. Okay. And it had been, and it had been a while. Yeah. Man, that must be terrible. Man. It hurts. Okay. Um, first <laughs> off, congrats to LSU. Um, this made me happy. Um, Tennessee beat both these teams, so I really didn't care who won. Um, but you know, seeing Nick Saban upset makes me it 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 he got hit up. really hard. Oh, I didn't see that. I saw one. that. Yeah. Did he take, did he yeah. Take I, I mean, ta- like, you know, tackle and someone like he did a, a downward dog um, yoga pose. Had to. to. So his legs wouldn't get taken out. Well, they still got taken out. But I'd say, didn't he get hit a couple of years ago and like rip something in his in his knee or something? Didn't that happen? Or I'm thinking somebody else. I don't remember. I'm thinking of somebody else. Anyway, that. regardless. Um, so kudos to LSU for getting this win. Um None of us picked LSU. Nobody in the media picked LSU. Uh, I don't think the drunk frat kids at LSU really thought they were going to pull this thing off, but they did find a way to do it. Um, that being said, um, I would like to specifically talk to the Tide fans for a moment. So I'm going to bring you in nice and close. Okay. Yeah, here. Jesse, this isn't directed directly at you, but okay. I do want to um, I want to go on, on record. It's, I'm gonna, This is the same conversation that we had like, I think it was three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, whatever it is, whenever the last time I heard people saying we should fire Nick Saban and go somewhere else, shut the heck up. I he lost that. two games. Shut it. Why are you <laughs> getting pissy about the fact that this man lost in overtime to Tennessee, who's a top five team this season, and lost in overtime to LSU, and you're calling about, you say he's lost touch, he's out of, he just, you need to retire. No, no, no. You stop that. I can tell you right now from experience, if you've got a coach that's winning, you let him go when he wants to go. You do not run him off. We did that with Phil Fulmer. Do you not remember how that went? We're still recovering, people. Don't do that to yourself. I have Chill not. Out. I have not Enjoy heard the fans say that. Like my, friend, I've heard. I've seen a couple of tweets. My I've friend, seen a couple of tweets. My friend, Bama fans that that are saying people reasonable. Love, <laughs> yeah, reasonable humans. <laughs> If you are a Bama fan that's saying that, you need to check yourself. You need to check yourself. I've your seen hair. some things. Uh, yeah. Don't ever claim to be a Bama fan if you are calling for Nick Saban's job right now. You have been just disenfranchised from us. We don't <laughs> accept you. Yeah. I think, if anything, it kind of speaks to um, just Saban's ability to make it work in the past. Because you think about how much turnover Bama's had at the coordinator positions and then magically it works out right it's like okay all right so and so's left for head coaching job again we gotta we gotta you know fill this spot and he does it you know sometimes every year sometimes every other year and you know thus far it's kind of worked out for the you know for the most part and so this is kind of new territory but again i mean that's just normal for for a position to have a lot of turnover and for it to not work out, I'd say that nine times out of ten, out of 10 that's what's going to happen at, uh, you know, other places. Um, and it just happens, you know, at, at Bama. Well, it's, it doesn't just happen. It's because Saban knows who to hire. That's what it amounts to. Yeah. And so, and then you run into a position like this where maybe it doesn't work out or what, what have you. And all of a sudden people are, all right, you know, all of a sudden everyone's losing their minds. Yeah. Um, well, so yeah. one other thing is like, because I've seen this. If Bama's not that big of a deal, why are you making us that big of a deal? Like, if you truly don't think we're that good anymore, then yeah. why are you storming your field? Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you see the big dude at the at the goalposts? <laughs> he's like, uh, he's like, these are not, was touching that these are not going down. <laughs> oh, God. That man was humongous. Um, uh, by the way, did y'all see the guy on game day with the sign that said, We don't rush the field when we win a regular season? Game? Uh, did you see that guy? I know. Did I you see that, that guy? I did. Uh, I, I want to mm. talk about that for a minute if we can, because I, loved it. I specifically remember after Tennessee lost to L or sorry, lost to Georgia in the year yeah. 2000, every one of them branches got ripped off of the hedges and they ripped that place apart. 
And that was Georgia fans. So don't go saying you don't rush the field after a regular season win because you do. I think, well, I don't know. Um, cause they were saying, they were saying the only time that it was, a, it was a Georgia, Tennessee game. I don't remember what season. Cause Georgia had lost to Tennessee. Like they had lost like five straight times to Tennessee. And that's nine. the only that, or okay. Yeah. Nine, even better. So, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's the only time that, uh, that I've heard that Georgia fans have stormed the field. So, um, for whatever, you know, I, they yeah. probably shouldn't have done it even then, but just, you know, there it is. Um, well, no one was touching that LSU goalpost. Say no. that right now. And LSU is even one the of those, lady uh... in her walker that managed to get. <laughs> How did that on. happen? I'm not joking. Yeah. I saw that video. Oh she yeah, I missed that. Yeah, um, LSU's already got the a uh, little bit more stable goalpost because they have the the supports on both sides. They go down to the ground, not just the single one in the middle. Anyway, um, so yeah, my my takeaway from this one, Bryce Young, Jesse, you mentioned him a little bit and just kind of some struggles that he had. I don't he can't hold on to the ball for as long as he does. And look, I, I just watching Bama, obviously, I know a lot of Bama fans. I've watched a lot of Bama games, and I don't know how many times I've seen him take big yardage sacks when he could just throw the ball away. Yeah. And I, I think the reason coaches are willing to deal with that is because every now and then he pulls the the crazy play and it ends up being amazing. And we even saw that oh, uh, yeah. was was it in it was in that game, wasn't it? Where was. he, he evaded I think it pressure was in overtime, wasn't it? Didn't uh, play, no, this was you know? in um it was in regular regular time. Uh, yeah. But it was like he scram he did the Johnny Manziel scramble and evaded pressure yeah. and 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 found the the open person for the, for the touchdown. Um, but um, yeah, like I said, that works out every now and then, and I think that's why they tolerate it. But I mean, th the drawbacks have got to be a lot more than than the good things that that come from it. Um, my second takeaway is Brian Kelly is annoying, <laughs> and uh -huh. he's he's like the male version of a Karen. And look, I'm not just saying that because of you know stuff LS, LSU fans being crazy, but um, I watched that game from start to finish, and I'd never really paid attention to it before. But Brian Kelly is constantly dogging on the refs the entire time yeah, the entire true. time and like i get it refs mess up you should call them out you should rag on them whatever but dude they're not wrong on every play you're not right on every play and i get you're trying to defend your team but it just makes you look like a whiner and you know i i don't know i just don't understand that like Wes, i get better be, Wes, you better be careful them lsu fans <laughs> are gonna start coming after you again i mean i, I don't have <laughs> I don't have a problem with it. I mean, when it's, you know, just if, if it's warranted, by all means, please state your case. But it's not every play, dude. It, it can't be every play. It's, it's just annoying. Um, then LSU is in the driver's seat, obviously, with this game in the West. I didn't definitely didn't think I'd be saying that even just a few short weeks ago. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. I mean, obviously, anything could happen. But uh, but right now they're in the driver's seat with a, a few games left in the season. So um let's uh let's move to south carolina at vanderbilt south carolina winning this one 38 to 27 i got the point in this one uh spencer rattler uh, getting three touchdowns in this one so you know we've uh ragged on him a lot this year uh yardage wasn't crazy and it, he was 16 to 23 but the three touchdowns that looks pretty good so they take care of business against vandy um who struggled to take care of the football with four turnovers in this game so uh with this win south carolina becomes bowl eligible with six wins so congrats to south carolina so you guys got any takeaways from this one penalties and some on the field going into halftime sass or whatever mm -hmm. that was seemed to affect the second half because um coach beamer said that he thought he saw a vandy player punch one of his guys um, the first two quarters ended with each team being, uh, or the first two quarters ended with each of the two teams being marched off the field, just jawing at each other, sassing each other and motioning. Like it was going to be some sort of rumble. I don't know. Um, whatever. So the officials go into the locker room as well. And I feel like they also made some adjustments. Um, I know the teams did, but in this case, they were like, all right, y'all want to act a fool. Okay. <laughs> four combined penalties before halftime combined cross both 13 after y'all want to act like fools we're going to treat you like fools because at this point i feel like they were looking for some extracurricular activity to make sure everyone was behaving um and while you're looking for extracurricular activities you tend to find curricular 
activities. Um, and so it was like flag, 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 flag. So that was the one takeaway. And then the other one is South Carolina is bowl eligible. Who yeah. Knows? Kudos. Matt, what'd you get? Um, <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say about this game. Um, say whatever we, you want. We, we start off saying Spencer Rattler had a decent day against the worst team in the league. Um, he threw for three. At least he didn't do bad. <laughs> against the worst team yeah. in the league. Uh, and you're right. At least he didn't have an awful day. But just everything around Carolina right now just doesn't smell good to me. And and I'm probably the mayo flamed by Carolina fans for that. And you're probably right. It probably is the mayo. But yeah. I just – why is Vanderbilt still in the SEC? Can we dump them <laughs> and, like, get FSU or something? Somebody that actually has some – Oh, no. I'd rather have um maybe North Carolina for some basketball. You know what? North yeah. Carolina would be a decent addition. Are you talking about, like, the uh, recreational softball approach where the bottom two teams get booted from yeah. the league? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's do that. But they do it to Lasso. Yeah, there. Yeah, there you it's go. Called, it's called regulation, right? That's what, that's what it is. Yes. Yeah. No, I agree. South Carolina should have won this one, so I think this was expected. Uh, kudos to them for becoming bowl eligible. Eligible once again. Uh, maybe Duke's Mayo again. I don't know. We'll see. Um, Meineke Car Tire Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it is kind of funny to think about these two teams just going at it. I mean, I don't know if they're just like. If Vandy's got that like small man syndrome where they're like, we're going to get this SEC win. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, I don't know if they're trying to get uh, SC off their game or what, but I don't know. Anyway, um, all right, let's move to Auburn at Mississippi State. Mississippi State winning this one 39 to 33. Matt gets the point in this one. Uh, Mississippi State led this one 24 to 3 in the second quarter, but uh, they just kind of stalled. <laughs> Uh, and Auburn's offense kind of kicked it into high gear. Um, eventually, they traded the lead a few times near the end of regulation. Uh, and then Mississippi State's kicker, uh, Massimo Biscardi, got iced twice by Cadillac Williams. I don't know if you guys saw that, but he had he had the timeouts to burn. So he uh, went ahead and, uh, and called uh, two, I think. Yeah, so he actually made the kick a total of three times, um, <laughs> although only one counted. Um, Auburn missed their field goal uh, in overtime. Uh, and so, uh, and then, uh, Jaquavius Marks ran it in for the touchdown and state wins. So, um, I think, um, it's an interesting struggle, Mississippi state, uh, up big and then just stalled out and, and let Auburn come back. Um, I don't know what do you guys takeaways for, for this one besides I mean, an epic rant by Mike Leach. Oh, that's amazing. I don't know if you're going to play it, but I'm not, I, I don't have it. I, okay. yeah, it is. Go it's, look it up folks. It's, it's great. incredible, it's but amazing. Will, honey, you have got to take care of the football, but it just seems like that wasn't a priority for him during this game. Uh, he had quite a few close calls um, for a Tiger defense that has not played well. And aside from two fumbles under pressure, he also had an interception in a crucial moment. A few other passes were nearly picked off, but the defenders seemed to, I don't know, not be paying as good of attention or had slippery hands. Um, and, and you just can't do that. You can't be careless with the ball like that, especially going into, you know, playing people like Georgia and Ole Miss in the egg bowl, you got to protect the football will. And, um, so hopefully he shapes up after that and then a nothing to lose Auburn team almost got it done. Maybe firing Ryan Harson was exactly what they needed to just be like, whatever, we'll just go play. Cause they were energized. Don't think about it. Yeah. Matt. We've, we've seen that particular phenomenon before though. Mm -hmm. Um, You saw it when Butch Jones got fired the next two games after him, things got a little bit better. Um, I think you saw the same thing when. um, Orgeron. Yeah. Oh, that's right. When Orgeron got the boot. um, Well, no, I was thinking when he came in as interim remember Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, at USC and, uh, down at LSU. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> there might be something to be, and I think that might have to do with like just one of those things about like, okay, pressure's off now. Mm-hmm. You already know that this season's kind of shot. Um, I, this game, I, I was, I was really kind of hoping Auburn would pull this off because I was a big fan of Cadillac Williams when he was in, when he was playing. He always seemed like a nice guy, Um, you know, but only 13 yards passing, or sorry, 13 yards rushing by Mississippi State. They don't like running the ball in, in Starkville, apparently. Their um their air raid is almost an extension of the run. It's like a 
No, it's I like know. a it's like a toss, <laughs> a yeah, toss yeah. sweep. I, I know I, I get it and I understand it, but man, yeah, I, it's, they don't must they, it is what it is. Yeah. yeah, don't go sit under a tree and and just eat a fish sandwich and not pay drink attention lemonade. to and drink lemonade and then not pay attention to um to the air raid. Apparently, they they like to do, to do that with their fat little girlfriend, is, which apparently is <laughs> is. Is a um is actually he's brought that out of retirement. Apparently, he said that once when he was at Texas Tech. He he used the fat little girl, little girlfriend comment back then. You know brought, what? He, I do remember that. Was that before or after he locked that kid in the closet? I gosh, no, I don't know. I, think it was before. <laughs> I don't know. And you guys saw during the game. Um, remember he uh, he had his conversation with the wide receivers, and then immediately went over there and uh, folded all their chairs up and threw them on the ground, so they had no place to sit. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> he's petty. Do you think we get Mike Leach on this program? I bet we could. Oh, I bet if, we, if we like find his email, I bet. I, we bet, could. I bet. I bet we could be like Coach Leach. Listen, we just want to. We just want you to talk. That's all yeah. we want. Doesn't even have to be about we football. Let's talk history. Anything. <laughs> yeah. Just, let's just anything. just dispel wisdom for us. An hour. Yeah. With go back through and find all of our just for fun segments and ask him and to ask answer. him. Yeah. All of them. No doubt, because um, yeah, it, it would be kind of like uh, you know, reminiscent of uh, when he was at Washington State and they asked him which uh, mascot would win in a battle, and he went through all of them. I remember <laughs> that strengths and weaknesses. Um, yeah, Aub- Auburn's got a lot to deal with right now. They've been through a lot. Uh, credit to him for not giving up. Uh, Robbie Ashford, to me, I, I I still say he looks better every game. To me, uh, his passing numbers weren't spectacular, but he's dangerous. And looks more and more comfortable out there each week. And that's a big part of it. Um, State got things going when they needed it. And uh, they become bowl eligible too. So there you go. Um, All right. That does it for last week's games. Um, For the pick'em standings, I got 34. Matt's got 27. Jesse with 16. Um, We're getting into the games that count more very soon with championship games, playoff games, bowl games, et cetera. Um, so uh, yeah, so as we mentioned at the uh, at the top of the show, there's uh, a bit of news. Here's the news. All right, so um, you know, as we mentioned, the new CFP rankings hot off the press as of uh, well, just an hour or two, a couple hours ago, as we record. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll just go down the list here. Number one is Georgia now. Number two, Ohio State. Number three, Michigan. Number four, TS. TCU, number five, Tennessee, number six, Oregon, number seven, LSU, number eight, USC, number nine, Alabama, number 10, Clemson, and then SEC teams rounding out top 25, a uh, number 11, Ole Miss, and number 24, Kentucky. What are you guys' thoughts? Did the did the committee get this right? Should they slide some teams up or down? I was glad Clemson got slid down, finally. Mm-hmm. By six, right? Yeah, there were four, right? When yeah, lost. yeah, yeah. Thank goodness. Um, I'm sure TCU fans are happy. Uh, I know Not... that they were all really mad that they were seven last week, so I don't know. Yeah, I was really hoping Northwestern was going to beat Ohio State. I really, man, they they teased us, didn't they? Because they no. sure thought about it. Apparently that was a, a a crazy game though. Did you guys hear about that? It was like gusty winds up to like 40, 50 miles yeah. an hour or something insane I mean, like that. It makes sense to me just knowing like where Northwestern is and and Evanston. It's essentially in Chicago. It's mm-hmm. just right outside. Um, I used to drive there all the time. Windy City. And it's <laughs> actually not called the Windy City because of wind. Fun fact. Um, it got nicknamed. There's a lot, a lot of people named Windy there. Uh, got nicknamed the Windy City because of all of the old corrupt politicians were full of air. Ah, oh, there you go. Oh, so yeah, nice. but it also is hella windy. <laughs> um, and they are very close to the water, so right. uh, that kind of lake effect wind. But no, it was a wild game. Um, man, I don't know. It's tough. I'm I'm torn between TCU and Tennessee there in uh, in four and five, but Oregon for sure not six to me. Yeah, they've been tearing it up since that uh, was it forty six point loss to Georgia uh, yeah. or whatever at the beginning of the season against who? Yeah, yeah. I mean that's 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 just it. And they were posing that question to um, oh gosh, what's the the chairman's name? It's Boo something. I can't remember. Um, 
they were posing that question to him like does competition play anything to it is that should we be impressed with Oregon I'm sure the Oregon fans were hating Reese Davis because he was just pounding them about that he's like oh I love my Reese (laughs) he looks like a mortician by the way (laughs) he does a little bit the guy that they've got running the CFP um if if I can interject my opinion as a Tennessee fan and as an independent uh sports media broadcaster um Georgia at one makes complete sense, especially after how they took care of business against Tennessee. Ohio State at two, mm, not when you struggle with Northwestern, who has one win on the season. Uh, I think they should probably be below Michigan um, and and maybe underneath TCU for that matter. Um, I'm okay with Tennessee at five. I personally maybe probably would have put Oregon above Tennessee just because – Oregon's taken care of business since that opening season loss against Georgia. And granted, that was a nuke uh, of epic proportions that happened in Atlanta for that game. Um, LSU at seven is a little lower than I was anticipating, but they've got more losses. So I guess that makes sense. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of shocked that Clemson's even the top 10. Yeah. You know, I'm, they've been they, flirting they, with that loss for a long time. But they, they have not looked great. They have not had they, their resume is not that good. The ACC is not looking that hot this year either. So at this point, putting them ahead of Ole Miss is disrespectful to Ole Miss, I think. Um, and putting and again, I don't know why Kentucky's in the top twenty-five. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to upset all the. Cats I think here. the the committee is just you know those those last like five spots or whatever. They're just kind of like ah eh, whatever. They kind of throw a bunch of names out there. But um, yeah, I um I I don't know. Um, I I do think as we said at the at the beginning of this segment or the be- or a little bit earlier in the show, rather um, that the committee has kind of made it known that they're still impressed with Tennessee. Um, mm-hmm. I know one to five is, you know, is, you know, a decent drop, but uh, um, they're still right there in terms of making it in. Right. And honestly, it looks pretty good because Tennessee, you know, and you know, not going to have to play in the, in the SEC championship, but you got teams around them that will likely get a loss. I mean, you look at uh, Oregon, uh, who knows with them, uh, TCU, they got a bunch of, you know, big 12 teams left and, and uh, craziness happens in the big 12 we've seen already this year. So it's, it's, it's very likely that the teams around Tennessee are going to lose. And then at that point, it's kind of depending on who's won, um, do they jump Tennessee or not? That's, that's what it's going to boil down to at that time. If Georgia wins out, then they'll obviously be locked in at one. Ohio State, Michigan will probably be two, depending on who wins that game. Yeah. The question is how close that game is. Right. If That's, Ohio yeah. State, Michigan comes down to overtime or a field goal, then you could potentially be looking at a one loss Big Ten team getting in. You have uh, to look over too. Tennessee. Michigan also has to play Illinois, which before would be a no-brainer, easy win game. Illinois is having a pretty good season. Illinois is having a run this season. Michigan still has to play them, and then they go directly into Ohio State. You could be looking at a two-loss Michigan team. Mm. I don't think they'll – I don't think they'll – they've looked pretty good. The couple games I've watched, Michigan's looked pretty good. Again, Big Ten, but we'll see how that goes. The real chaos is going to happen, and I I don't think it'll happen, but it would be interesting to see what happens – if LSU manages to win the SEC championship. Yeah, they talked about that too. Um, sitting, at, sitting at seven, if they find a way to knock off number one, they're automatically caught, catapulted into the top four. They have to be. You have to be. So, you would think so. But you would then you got to wonder, does Georgia drop completely out? Um, I doubt it. I have don't think so, but then everyone the will be week? pissed that there's two SEC teams in it again. There well, are they're going to be pissed either way because you're yes. already going to have two and they're as is. Although TCU is going to be the 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 key here, because if TCU finds a way to win out and wins the Big Twelve, they'll probably be in. You, then I don't see how you leave them out, especially like, given where they, they are now. I well, can't. you say that, but then we had you know not last year, but year before last, undefeated Cincinnati team that did not make it in. Yeah, but that's Cincinnati. That's a little bit different. With the committee putting TCU at four right here, I, I, I'd almost think they've kind of put them so, painted themselves into a corner, right? If TCU wins out, what are you going to do? Drop them after they've won? <laughs> like, you can't, right? Yeah. Um, I, would, I would say it, they'll probably move ahead of whoever loses Ohio State-Michigan. 
and then what if what if probably, um, probably just sit at that three what if ohio state michigan is two and three and michigan beats ohio state by like a field goal or a, a last minute whatever do you <laughs> what do you do with that it's you have teams right next to each other up top and they the basically committee... played each other equally I'm telling you, the committee will keep Ohio State in because of the quarterback. That's why they will do it. That's why everyone um, before Clemson lost, you're looking at Clemson, why people were like, I mean, yes, they don't have a, a good schedule, but also they don't have that stud quarterback. You yeah. look at, you look at, um, yeah, you look at Ohio State, they're going to look at the quarterback and be like, well, this, you know, he's, he's a game changer and they've got all this talent. They'll put him in, even if they get beat by Michigan. Yeah. By the way, well, can y'all name a single player off that Michigan team? I can't. No. Yeah, but I mean, it's just not a Big Ten podcast. They had here. a lovely, <laughs> lovely story on one of their players a few weeks ago. That mm-hmm. Like I could name a couple people off that Ohio State team, but I can't for the life of me remember a single name off that. Oh, Charbonne. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, the... I'm warming up the old khaki pants. You oh my gosh, no. who are He's you? done. He's done a pretty good job up there. Remember, Michigan used to suck. They're all right. Well, I, don't know. I like them I, better I, than Ohio State. I'm beginning Ohio to wonder State. if uh, Tennessee's success this year softened your heart a little bit. What's you going on? What? <laughs> I do. I am feeling a little bit more magnanimous, as it were. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. Because I was going to say that is not what you have said about Jim Harbaugh uh, in the past. So yeah. quite the opposite. Uh, that was that was crazy. Let, let bygones be bygones. Five five and six on the season, Fortson. That's a different one. The <laughs> moment he starts talking positively about Eli Drinkwitz is when I'm going to be real. Oh no, I right. will never, ever, never <laughs> say anything good about that. You know what? I'm I'm starting to come around to old Drinky. He's okay. <laughs> well, we've got two extra years with him, guys. That's true. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, listener feedback. And there was uh, there was a lot of you it. want answers. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. I, I, so I didn't go back and and look at the number of comments, but it was a lot. It was a lot of comments that uh, LSU fans have had regarding a video that we made. Uh, like, might I remind you, like two weeks ago, if not longer. I think it was a little bit longer than two weeks ago. But uh, we've had numerous requests from TikTok users. Uh, who've watched our segment on um, is LSU's rebuild ahead of schedule or should we pump the brakes on that? Um, so um, we we answered, we each of us answered that question. Uh, uh, pump the brakes is what we each said in a way that was really benign. It wasn't inflammatory at all, like LSU's trash or Brian Kelly sucks or Mike the Tiger's lame or <clears throat> anything remotely close to that. Like each of us simply said, pump the brakes, and each of us provided uh, logical reasons why. So now, before I get into the real substance of this, I'd just like to say that all comments that were personal attacks or were just insults instead of driving a productive conversation forward were deleted and will continue to be deleted. Um, I've made it clear that the point of this show is to exhibit to the world that we can, in fact, change the narrative and expectation when it comes to fan interaction. Um, that we can interact and even even disagree, you know, imagine that, about things without devolving into name-calling and childish insults. Uh, anyway, um, also, um, on a, you know, worse note, a number of guys also singled Jesse out, which is not cool. It's, it's a bad look right off the bat, and it makes them look like Neanderthals, I'm just saying. Um, I, I get that in um, that particular instance, in just how the clip went, uh, she answered first. And so that's the part of the clip you see first. I, I understand that. Plus, Bama and LSU just played each other. So LSU fans would be p- particularly pumped about that. <clears throat> but the fact that they kind of mainly went after her in the comments was unacceptable, especially given the fact that Matt and I also said pump the brakes um, in that segment. Emphatically. Um, yeah, I, I don't know why people have to disrespect others based on gender. It's really aggravating. Um, Jesse demonstrates every week that she knows what she's talking about, comes to the show absolutely prepared. And I've always been of the mind that if somebody knows what they're talking about, who cares what gender they are? Who, like, literally, who cares? The the thing is, uh, most of these people would probably deny making it about gender. I'm sure if you went to each one of them, be like, no, that's not what I was saying at all. But when you read the comments, it's obvious how they feel based on condescending and mansplaining tones. So um a a bunch of people also said things to us as a group like how does it feel to be so wrong and you guys are stupid and you guys don't have a clue blah 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 
Oh, and by the way, I also um, discovered what STTDB means. Yes, LSU fans, uh, which I will not utter here, but stay classy, Baton Rouge. Anyway, um, when people ask how it feels to be wrong, you know, ab about something like that, I just say it feels fine because honestly, if I could go back and answer that same question, given the same data that we had to go on, I would answer the same way. Uh, LSU hadn't proved anything just a few short weeks ago. Um, they looked really good in that second half against Ole Miss, but that's literally all we had to go on. Um, I don't take football that personally. I don't think you guys do either, where I brood about being wrong on one of my opinions. Like, good grief. Like, how, how sad does your life have to be that you think we just sit around thinking, oh, no, I was wrong. How am I going to say how am I going to face the world? Um, so, uh, look, OK, LSU is building their program and is ahead of schedule. I think that's become clear now, which is still kind of silly to say after winning a natty just a few years ago, it's like a rebuild. I mean, I think the talent's been there. It's just maybe not necessarily managed well <clears throat> anyway, but yes, Brian Kelly's team is ahead of schedule. So kudos to them and LSU fans have to be thrilled no matter what happens the rest of this season. Um, that's all I'll say um, that my opinion about teams as always evolves as the season progresses and as teams prove themselves or don't <laughs> do you guys have any response any other responses i I'll, would I'll, I'll agree. To Jesse. yeah i would agree um as you know as maybe the only person who's actually um sat in the room with brian kelly before and uh interviewed the man and done media with him lsu fans he was at notre dame but um he was lovely to be in a room with um, and he's a very knowledgeable guy. Yes. He's kind of a, a pain on the sidelines, but I think he's, I think he's a great coach. I think we've all said the cultural fit was a little weird for us when he came to LSU. Um, but again, yeah, I would have the same opinion. I would think the same thing if I were to go back and look at the, the data again, it's, it's tough to say when teams are fully back, right? Because you go from this incredible LSU natty which i think i mentioned a few weeks ago when we were talking about it is you go from this natty to just abysmal um and it's not just lsu on rebuilds that are are hard to buy into when they're starting to do well it's any team i mean you look at gosh you look at alabama when we got nick saban nobody thought we were going to be on the up and up and it was a lot quicker than we even alabama fans thought um it's a it's that way at any team so yeah, given the the same data, I'd make the same opinion, but I do think that, like I said, we got out coached on Saturday. So props to them. Um, they prepared well for us. Their fans made a huge difference in Death Valley. They always do. Um, but yeah, uh, so to um to any man or frat, frat daddy or whoever you are, um I'm good on um on your your little acronym i'm gonna i'm gonna pass but thank you matt do you have anything uh, it, it's it's a very simple equation don't be a jerk um <laughs> it, it it's, it's really difficult what it boils down for to. some people it's not complex in any way shape or form listen we get on here and the three of us only we aren't getting paid for this yeah. we don't make yeah. any money off this this is simply just three people getting together to talk football because we enjoy talking football. Um, none of us are looking to make this a career. None of us are looking to blow up. Um, this is just something we do on the side for kicks and giggles. When it becomes an issue where you're telling people to uh, simulate certain acts that involve animals and all kinds of stuff, I just, it's, it's not necessary. I get it. I understand it, but it's just, it's not, and I told Wes, I was like, you know, Tennessee's got some acronyms that I thought were a bit much, but boy, that one. Whoo. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that doesn't really G Hall about this is, you know, me and Wes know a good little bit about football. Jesse knows more than both of us put together and then multiplied by three. So don't sit there and think just because she has different genetic makeup than the two of us that she isn't fully capable of understanding how football works. Not to mention the fact that she actually has the the broadcasting background and everything else <laughs> right. that goes with it. So really, when you when you make fun of her for being a woman and talking sports, you're really just showing how much of an ass hat you are. Actually, if not, and it, not to put too fine a point on it, 
Well, and uh, also if you've uh, you know been around when when somebody says something like that to to Jesse in public, it's actually quite hilarious. Um, and uh, you really just d don't say anything. You just kind of let her do her thing and let them feel stupid afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so, because so, it's kind of kind of comical. But anyway, yes. So I I agree with that sentiment, uh, Matt. You nailed it right on the head. Uh, don't be a jerk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so simple. All right. Well, uh, I think. Do we have anything else, did you, Jesse? Do you have anything else? Um, no. Okay. No. Well, I think we we got that response. Um, so there you go, LSU fans. There's the response. So, um, let's go ahead and uh, talk about some of these upcoming games. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble. All right. Well, um, so the first game of the upcoming games is uh, Missouri at four and five, two and four in the SEC at Tennessee. Uh, eight and one, four and one in the SEC. That is noon on, and I'm not really sure. Matt, do you know the the network? They were undecided when I was kind of putting this together. Um, not sure what station it's on. Anyway, it's I, give me give me a minute. I'll look. As I say it's on noon. Um, you know, regardless. So, um, check that check that out. But um, Jesse, what is what is your prediction uh, for Missouri at Tennessee? You know, my biggest thing is I'm just not sure if if Matt is going to be able to emotionally pull for the Vols against Drinky. I just know how strong the connection oh, yeah. is there. And I know that that's going to be hard. Yeah. So I, I will be thinking about you uh, on, you know, the noontime slot because that that must be a difficult, um, you know, a difficult time to pull for the Vols <laughs> against your man. Uh, but I, I'm going to pick the Vols and I think that they are going to be really pissed off after this Georgia embarrassment. Um, and they're going, you know, they're playing Mizzou. They're playing back at Neyland. Again, how are they getting so many home games? But I'm going to pick the Vols 38 to 14. Matt, what's your, what's your prediction? Uh, listen, I think Tennessee is going to be looking to put some 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 boots to rear ends, as an old football coach of mine used to say. And I think that Tennessee is going to do a pretty good job of doing that. Um, excuse me. I've been waiting for an opportunity to make Eli Drinkwitz look silly. And I think this is what the Vols are going to do. So I'm going to take Tennessee in this game. I know that's shocking. I know that's surprising. Um, so Vols win big, 42-14. Uh, I would be willing to say that uh, most of those points will come in the first half. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I I can't see Tennessee not bouncing back here. Um, now, uh, we said Mizzou's kind of sneaky good, uh, but I think that's kind of a moot point here. I, I don't think that they have the personnel – to match up against Tennessee's receivers. Um, so I, I just see Tennessee just, you know, running all over the field and uh, scoring touchdowns as they are wont to do this season. Um, it's in Neyland too, and the fans are going to show full support, I'm sure. So uh, I've got uh, Tennessee big in this one as well, 45 to 17. By the um, way, everything I've looked at says it's either on CBS or ESPN. It doesn't sound like they've made a decision. Okay, yeah, I did see where they were. Yeah, they were throwing around different times for the CBS games. I know they got because the, the typical the LSU. One. The LSU Arkansas game is also in that twelve o'clock slot, and it's also CBS or ESPN. Right. Yeah. So, yes. So I imagine so, one will be on one, one will be on the other. Yeah, <clears throat> makes sense. All right. Well, um, speaking of which, let's talk about LSU uh, seven and two, five and one in SEC at Arkansas five and four, two and three in the SEC. That is noon on one of those networks. I think it was ESPN when I was looking. But um, what are your uh, Jesse? What are your predictions for LSU at Arkansas? Yeah, I think LSU is obviously going to be hyped. Arkansas is going to be distraught um, and trying to come back, but I just don't think that Arkansas has it in them which makes me really sad to say, knowing that we had such high hopes for them this season. Um, so I'm going to pick the Tigers 35 to 14. And the only reason I'm picking, you know, even two touchdowns for Arkansas is it is in Fayetteville. And I think they're going to be upset with how last game went, but I just don't think they can get it done. All right, Matt. I think this is going to be a bounce back game for Arkansas. I think they're going to come out and surprise people in the first quarter. Um, I think LSU is probably going to be coming off a little bit of a hangover from last week. Also, it being a noon game, also it being in Fayetteville, I think there's a couple factors that have to be taken into account. So with that being said, I'm not going to say LSU is going to lose this game. I think LSU is going to win, but I think the score is going to be a little bit closer than what most people would think. So I'm going to say 28-20 LSU. 
Yeah, I'm completely on board with that. Um, I think uh, it's a bit of a hangover game, as you mentioned, for LSU on the road. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that they'll actually get it done in, in a dramatic turn of events. I'll actually believe in LSU since apparently we hate them so much. I'm going with uh, LSU in a close one, 31 to 28. So, um, all right. Next is Vanderbilt at Kentucky, um, six and three. Uh, I'm sorry. Vanderbilt is three and six, 0 and five in the SEC. Kentucky is six and three. Three and three in the SEC. That is noon on SEC Network. Uh, Jesse, what's your prediction for Vanderbilt at Kentucky? I'm I'm hoping Kentucky gets it together just a little bit, and luckily they are in uh, in Lexington. But yeah, they've got to make some improvements. Give Will Levis the time that he needs. Rodriguez has got to get stuff down on the ground, and if they're able to do that, then I'm picking UK at 31 to 10, and Vanderbilt still. And not get that SEC win. That elusive SEC win. Matt, what you got? Did they win? They won a conference game last year, didn't they? Maybe. No, no. I think the last time they won an SEC game was like back in 2019 against Mizzou or something like that. Ooh. It's been a long time. Oh, that's yeah. rough. Um, yeah, I, I don't see them picking one up here either. Uh, uh, Kentucky's got too many weapons. Um, this is at Kroger Field. Eh, it's not very good look for Vanderbilt. Kentucky's going to win 28-14. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think uh, Kentucky's step, taken a step back this year, but I, I don't think they've regressed to the point of getting beaten by Vandy at home. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Kentucky winning this one 34-17. to So um, <clears throat> next is Alabama 7-2, and 4-2 and two in the SEC at Ole Miss. Uh, eight and one, four and one in the SEC. That is three o'clock on CBS. Uh, Jesse, what is your prediction for Alabama at Ole Miss? Well, my hope is that we do the same thing with this Mississippi team that we did after the loss to Tennessee with Mississippi State. Hmm. Um, it is not at Bryant Denny, though. So that is a little nerve wracking. It will be in Oxford. I know that our favorite Lane Kiffin loves to just stick it to Nick Saban hmm. and or really anybody, but um, Ole Miss Nick is, is his buddy. It's his buddy. It is. <laughs> they have a common enemy in Jimbo Fisher, which is really fun. Uh, but the thing is, Ole Miss has to play consistently. They have to play for four full quarters, which they have not been able to do thus far. But Alabama has a lot to clean up, uh, and some of it is is not going to be the players' fault. It's going to be coaching. So I'm going to pick the tide in this one, but I think it's going to be a close one. I'm going to pick Bama 31 to 28. Okay, Matt. Mm. I would be I would be so excited about this, this game if LSU if it was seven and or sorry if it was eight and one Alabama and eight and one Ole Miss I'd be so excited because this game would determine who's going to win the in win the West. Mm-hmm. Um, but then LSU had to go and throw a wrench in the, the, those works. I, I, mm, Wes, you go ahead. I'm going to ruminate a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I had a tough time with this one also, uh, Bama simply hasn't looked like Bama this year. Um, overall, uh, Ole Miss has an incredible rushing attack with Quinshawn Judkins. Uh, Lane seems to have his head on right. And I bet he's cool before this game, uh, and won't mention anything about getting your popcorn ready. Like last time. Um, then I remembered how badly Ole Miss's passing game has struggled this year, <laughs> showing fr- uh, flashes of brilliance, but uh, as you said, Jesse, uh, inconsistent. So um, I know this is a home game for Ole Miss, but I have to believe that Bama's going to get back on track here, uh, even e- even if just a little bit. I'm going to go with uh, Bama in this one, 35-24. to 24. Matt? Yeah, I uh, I elected to go with Bama too. I just looked at the line a second ago. Bama's favored by twelve right now, mm. um, and depending on a couple bounces of the ball, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Ole Miss could cover that, but uh, we'll see. So I'm going to say Bama thirty twenty one. All right, um, all right. Next is uh, South Carolina at six and three, three and three in the SEC at Florida. Five and four, two and four in the SEC. That's four o'clock on SEC Network. Uh, Jesse, what's your prediction for South Carolina at Florida? Both of these teams are going to come in hype. South Carolina is bowl eligible. Uh, Florida is looking to be bowl eligible and just beat Texas A&M on the road. So they have got to be feeling really good. Both of these teams have to be immensely careful of the other. Luckily for Florida, they are playing in the swamp though that has not provided much of an advantage for them this season. 
unlike in seasons past. So I think these teams are eh, kind of close, but I believe that Florida with Richardson has better leadership at the home than South Carolina does with Spencer Rattler. So I'm going to pick UF in a relatively close one, 28 to 21. All right, Matt. Yeah, I don't foresee Beamer ball being able to really have much of an effect on the Gators. Um, Richardson's come on in the last game. He looked good last week. Uh, maybe he'll continue to look good. Carolina's defense has not looked great this season. Um, so I'm going to go with Florida here, 33-21. Yeah, Florida's coming off a, a big win on the road, uh, even if it was against AM second string for the most part. Um, South Carolina uh, also uh, got back in the win column against Vandy after their loss to Mizzou. I think uh, I think Florida's going to benefit from being at home, although, Jesse, you said that's been a little sus this year. Um, I don't see South Carolina's offense having the kind of success they had last week. So I'm going to go with Florida here, 34 to 27. Um, next is Georgia at 9 and 0, 6 and 0 in the SEC at Mississippi State, 6 and 3, 3 and 3 in the SEC. That's 7 o'clock on ESPN. Uh, Jesse, your prediction for this one? Well, I bet not a single man in Starkville is going to be eating a fish sandwich and lemonade this week. <laughs> um, I promise you that. But unfortunately for our sweet, sweet Mike Leach, uh, the dogs are going to keep on rolling. And with the performance of Will Rogers this past week, not being able to hold on to the football, the Georgia defense is going to eat him alive. So I'm picking the, well, I guess they're both Bulldogs, but I'm picking <laughs> UGA 38 to 17. Matt? Yeah, I uh, if Hen and Hooker couldn't get it done against that, uh, almost said bear defense against that, uh, uh bears. Defense, I, I don't foresee this going well for Mike Leach and the uh, and the Bulldogs. So, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pick UGA 42 14, and I think both of the touchdowns at Mississippi State will get in this game will come late. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you don't want to underestimate, and George's got to be careful on the road against a very unusual passing game. Um, they have played very talented. Uh, they just got done playing a very talented passing team, but Mississippi state's passing attack is a little bit more of an extension of the run. As I mentioned earlier, getting the ball out quickly in the hands of the playmakers. It's just a, a different feel. Uh, I think the defense is going to have to play disciplined once again, kind of keep the play in front of them. Um, and the offense is going to have to play to win, not conservatively. So um, I think if they do those things, they'll be fine. I got Georgia here 34 to 17. And then the last game of the day is uh, AM and uh, at three and six, one and five in the SEC at Auburn, three and six, one and five in the SEC, 7.30 on SEC Network. <clears throat> Jesse, your prediction for a and at Auburn. This is exciting. Um, yeah. I believe a and will likely have back most of the, the gentlemen that were out with the flu, but who knows what strain they have. Regardless, right. I liked some of the the grittiness and moxie I saw from Auburn last week. Again, they have nothing to lose at this point, so why not? And it is a night game in Jordan Hare, which we all crazy. Don't trust. So I'm gonna take the Tigers in a close one, 28 to 24. All right, Matt. Uh, I'm I'm gonna break from the pack on this one. I'm gonna go ahead and say that A and M finds a way to get it done. Jimbo gets his second conference win of the game of the season and you end up with Tammy you finding a way to win this game 28 21. All right. You know Auburn's actually favored by two in this one. At least they were the last I looked. Um they, I just looked at it. They are according to ESPN. And so um you know what I'm gonna jump in on that that vibe. Um I like uh Cadillac Williams energy. I, I just really enjoyed watching him coach last weekend. He's a seems like a cool a cool guy. Um, and I think Robbie Ashford is maturing and you're going to become more confident in each game, continue to become more confident, taking care of the football. Uh, a ms offense remains a question mark. Um, so like you said, not really sure who's going to be back. Connor Wigman has looked really good in, in some moments. And so uh, I don't really know uh, how that's going to work out or if it's going to be more of the same or if they're going to struggle. But uh, I sort of see these two teams kind of beginning to blend together in terms of quality, which is probably more scary to A&M fans, <laughs> considering the struggles that Auburn's had the past few years. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to go with Auburn in this one. I got to Auburn 24 to 21. So um, I, with those games being talked about now, what is the game to watch this week? What do you guys think? I think it's Bama Ole Miss. Yeah. 
I mean, I know that LSU is obviously in the conversation, but I think just it, it'll just make the conversation even tougher if Ole Miss beats us. So the the uh, only way that I would say LSU Arkansas is only going to be interesting if Arkansas somehow pulls off a, a miracle. Otherwise, I, I mean, I think it's just kind of whatever. But uh, Alabama Ole Miss is definitely the most intriguing. Obviously, you got Lane going against Saban again. Um, yeah, I, I I'm probably most excited to watch that one. Yeah. Matt. I, I think that the, I agree with y'all. I mean, I think the game to watch this week is definitely LSU. Oh, sorry, is definitely Alabama Ole Miss. Just given the implications of what that means for um, the SEC West race, what it means for you know potentially rankings going into the end of the season. But I think the sneaky pick is going to be that LSU Arkansas game. I got something that tells me in my gut that that game is going to come to it's going to be closer than we're probably thinking it's going to be. Um, and again, we know in the SEC that teams run on emotions. And if you're coming off a big emotional win, it's real easy to get caught in a trap and get caught in one of those trap games. And I think Arkansas may be it. Ooh. That would be, oh, man, that, that'd be wild. That would sure. be mass chaos. Because then what would happen if Arkansas finds a way to pull that off? Yeah. Uh, that means LSU drops to five and two in the conference. Right. Which means that they'd be tied with Alabama. With head to head beats Ole Miss, but if Ole Miss, see, this is all a way for me to get Ole Miss into the SEC championship. <laughs> so if Ole Miss beats Bama, yeah, and LSU loses to Arkansas, then Ole Miss just has to beat Mississippi State in the Egg Bowl, and then they're in. And then I'm yeah. happy again. Yeah. Oh man, that's yeah. That opens the door for sure. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But uh, yeah, that does it for the for the upcoming games. That does it for this episode. Thank you guys for for listening. Um, if you guys would like to contact us, please email us at pigskinsandpageantry at gmail.com. We are at Pigskins and Pageantry on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, we are at PPSEC Podcast on Twitter. Uh, don't forget we are available for download on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and most podcasting apps for iPhone, Android, and other operating systems. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and subscribe. Review. We'd love five stars. Uh, we're also on uh, Amazon Music and uh, iHeartRadio, so check us out there, whichever platform you prefer. So, yeah, uh, we are, uh, we're we're rolling on towards the end of the season. Uh, lots of interesting games and, and uh, interesting matchups left, though. Um, until next time, this is Wes. Go dogs. Y'all, we made it to another week despite our heartache. Hang in there, Bama fans. We're going to be all right. And uh, go beat those Rebel, Long Shark, whatever they're called, Land Shark. I don't know. Who knows? Real tide. <laughs> Guys, it's simple. Eli Drinkwitz is a horse's patoot. Let's crush him. Crush him. Go balls. <laughs>